Hey everyone, Thrasher here. We are on our final topic for rotational motion. And it is really just a continuation on conservation of angular momentum. For this video though, we are going to combine things moving linearly in straight lines with things that can rotate. And we can actually still apply our conservation of angular momentum problems to these types. We just got to figure out how do we go from things moving in straight lines to things rotating. That's going to be the key. So to start off, let's just look back at the basics behind things that are rotating. And I actually want you to think back when we were looking at rotational inertia. I had this diagram. And it was a plane, it had like some thruster, some engine force that was acting on it, and it was spinning around in a circle. Now, before we started rotation, we would very obviously look at this plane as something moving in a circle, right? It's going around a circle of radius r, it has some centripetal acceleration, it had some tangential velocity. But when we looked at this for rotational inertia, we saw that, well, you could also look at it as a mass that's rotating about some center hinge, especially if it helps you think about it. It's connected to like a light massless, if you will, rod. And this whole thing is rotating piece by piece, covering a certain angle theta in a certain amount of time. And we could get away with that because there's not one correct coordinate system in physics. You can choose. Also remember like we could choose our starting points when we would do like uh, kinematic equations. We tilted our axes when we did inclined planes. All of those stuff, uh, all those things are up to our discretion as long as we're being consistent. So you can look at something that's clearly moving in circular motion as something that's rotating. The same is true for things that are moving in straight lines. Weirdly enough, you could approach it as something that's rotating. That's what we're going to look at next. Let's say I have a plane, and the plane is clearly moving in a straight line with some velocity v, and here you are watching the plane. All right, well, as a reminder, it'll come up a little later, we had these equations that let us translate to go from linear velocity, translational velocity, to angular velocity. It just had to do with the radius. Well, you probably never thought of it this way, but this plane going at a speed v is some distance r away from you. So if you have r and v, at this moment, you could think of this plane as having an angular velocity. And it'd be weird to even go a step further, uh, but think of the plane as now rotating as if it was a ball attached to an end of a string, and it could rotate around like this. So right at this moment, if we snapped a picture with v and r, you could actually give it an angular velocity. Now, the reason we haven't been doing this is because obviously another few moments later when the plane is now further ahead, we have a totally different r value. So the angular velocity would change. V is the same, but r is clearly different. We're not going to start using rotation to look at things as they move in a straight line. That would probably require calculus because you'd have to take into account the fact that r is changing with respect to time. But that doesn't change the fact that at one moment, right here, this plane very legitimately has an angular velocity relative to this origin, which we can choose, with this r value and this v. So you can actually treat objects moving in a straight line as having some angular motion. And again, to be clear, we'll do that for one instant. Right when the plane is here, it could have some or it does have some angular velocity. We won't look at it over, over time. This is why I bring this up. If we want to have problems that have linear momentum and angular momentum, when you set up an equation, you can't mix and match. You can't combine your apples and oranges. We have to use the same coordinate system, either the rotational coordinate system or the linear coordinate system. And since now we can look at a particle that's moving in a straight line as something that's rotating, we can use this angular coordinate system even for things moving translationally. 
Let's see how we do that. So, my diagram. This is a bird's eye view. I have a door, and here's the hinge, and it's like someone fired a bullet at the door. And the bullet is fired, it's traveling at some speed, it's going to hit the door some distance or away. All right, it's going to hit some distance or away from that hinge. The door starting off at rest. Bullet has some mass. Of course, the door has some mass. So we're looking at a bullet traveling in a straight line. It collides with the door. And let's set up the angular momentum for this bullet. No, oh, sorry. Animations. This is part B. Showing how we convert from linear momentum into angular momentum. Well, remember... The bullet's moving in a straight line. Let's just look at the bullet right before impact, when the bullet's like right here. Obviously, it's moving in a straight line, but we're just going to focus on that split second right before impact, when it's right at that spot. Well, if I want to calculate angular momentum, I need the rotational inertia of an object, of the object, times its angular velocity. For a point particle, remember, this is the one that you should just kind of know. You'll never have to know the fractions for different objects. For example, doors, the fraction is one-third mr squared. But just for a point-like object, the bullet, I is simply mr squared. So right before impact, it has a rotational inertia of m times r squared and an angular velocity. Well, we already saw the cheat for angular velocity. Angular velocity is equal to V over R. So I have the angular momentum of the bullet is M times R squared times V divided by R. I have R squared divided by R. Ah, I canceled out one of these R's and I rearranged terms. The angular momentum of the bullet is simply the mass times the velocity of the bullet times R, the distance away from our hinge, from our reference, our origin point. Well, this is interesting. I have m times v. What's m times v? Oh, that's right. That's the linear momentum of the particle. So really, the angular momentum of the bullet, or any single mass point object, is just its linear momentum. That's easy. That's mv times r, the distance from that axis. So. Again, we have kind of this easy translation of cousins. We can pretty easily go from linear momentum to angular momentum just by multiplying by r. So this is how I can treat the linear momentum of the bullet. I can convert it to angular momentum just by knowing how far away it is from the hinge. So last step, let's see how we would actually apply this for a problem. Okay, If we were trying to find Maybe what happens when the bullet slams into the door, it wedges in, and then the door starts to creak and slide and rotate away. It's kind of like one of those ballistic pendulum problems. Bullet hits the door, it gets wedged in, and the door and the bullet start rotating backwards. Let's just see how you would set that up. We know that initial angular momentum should equal final angular momentum. My system is the bullet and the door. There's no outside torques. So angular momentum is conserved. Well, I just add them up. All right, so I take the angular momentum of the bullet, add that to the angular momentum of the door. That should equal the combined angular momentum because we'll treat this as an inelastic type collision. They'll wedge in. They'll stick together. Well, what we saw from the last slide, angular momentum is linear momentum times r. Here it is for the door, whatever the rotational inertia of the door is times its starting velocity. Remember, we added up those rotational inertias after. We have our final velocity there. Well, the door starts at rest, so there is no initial angular momentum. I'm sorry, there is no initial angular velocity. So I just have PR equals MR squared plus one third MR squared. Again, this just happens to be the rotational inertia for the door, you don't have to memorize it, times omega. Well, that's how I could set it up. If I know the mass of the bullet, the velocity of the bullet, the r of the bullet, again, this distance r, the mass of the door, the radius of the door, I could solve for, depending on what I'm given, certain quantities. 
So we can now look at objects moving in straight lines, colliding with things that can then rotate. All you have to know really is first how you set up conservation of momentum and how you translate linear momentum into angular momentum. That's all I have. Thanks for watching.